On this episode of This Week in Linux, we got a lot of big news. From the Linux kernel, Debian, Grub, OpenSUSE's Open Build Service, Magia, Hunix, Linux Mint, and more. We'll also check out some hardware news regarding a portable monitor, some new hardware from NVIDIA, and some new hardware from AMD. Speaking of AMD, Valve announced some exciting news for AMD gamers regarding improvements to Vulkan shaders. We'll also take a look at a new GNOME shell replacement called Material Shell. It has a lot of potential. We've got some anniversaries to celebrate for Zorin OS and Gaming on Linux. Then we'll round out the show with some more Linux gaming news featuring Rocket League. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux good news. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, load balancers, integrated firewalls, and more. You can get all this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. You can get started on DigitalOcean for one month for free with a $50 credit by going to do.co slash tux. That's do.co slash tux. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean for free with a $50 credit by going to do.co slash tux. And thanks again for DigitalOcean for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up first in the show this week is the probably the most important topic that we cover on the show because this is the show called This Week in Linux. We're going to talk about the latest version of the Linux kernel, which is 5.2, a.k.a. Bobtail Squid. This version has over 596,000 lines of code committed, and it has a lot of cool features that were added in this one. I can't cover everything because there's so much of it, but I'm going to cover some highlights that I think are worth talking about. For example, there's better AMD Ryzen laptop support with the addition of the new PCIe MP2 drivers. G the GeForce GTX 1650 gets Nuvo support. Intel Ice Lake or Gen Generation 11 graphics are now considered production ready and no longer hidden behind a module parameter. The mainline drivers for ARM Mali GPUs are available. USB Type-C now adds support for DisplayPort alternate mode and firmware flashing. And at long last, we now have support for Intel Sound Open Firmware with, within the audio drivers. This is an open source audio firmware initiative that Intel has been working on, and it's pretty promising. Uh, there's also better support for Logitech wireless keyboards and mice. And there's also going to be to a remover or deprecation of IDE drivers, which I find interesting because I was, I'm was i surprised that IDE is still a part of the kernel in the first place. So anyway, that's good because they're getting rid of old code that's unnecessary. But well, they did take a very long time to do it, which I respect that decision. Uh, call back to previous episodes. Anyway, so also one I think is probably the most interesting to me in this particular release is that the Extended 4 file system now supports per directory case insensitive file folder name support using Unicode. This is an opt-in feature and there's already uh, some patches for wine staging and other things for like those kind of uses of this new code. But this is a really interesting thing because... A complaint we've seen for a while is that it's kind of confusing when if you have capitalized uh, folder names or file names and you have lowercase file names of the same exact name but there's just different capitalization, they would be considered separate files, would be confusing to people who just get into using Linux. And I actually kind of defaulted to always using lowercase because of this problem. And it also means because I'm, I'm doing commands and I'm going through like CD directories and change directory and I need to make sure that I remember is this a capitalized folder or not and that kind of thing. So it's interesting because Extended 4 is now getting support for this case in sensitivity, which has a lot of potential. It also has a little bit of bug issues that could arise from this, but based on the fact that they're using Unicode to do it, it might be... Uh, not, not not much of an issue. So we'll have to see. There's some debates about whether or not this is a good idea or not. Uh, you know, Mac did this a long time ago, and they ran into some issues. But 
the way they're doing it, I think, has a ton of potential to be a reasonable way of doing it, which is really cool because I do think that having case insensitivity has some benefit to it. So it's really cool that they're doing this, and there's a lot more stuff for the Linux kernel 5.2. And if you'd like to learn more and see all the different features, I have a link to the latest blog post or latest uh, mailing list announcement for the lkml.org uh, for Linux kernel 5.2 in the show notes. Up next in the show this week is some very big news from the Debian team, and that is the release for Debian 10, a.k.a. Buster. And Debian 10 comes with 4.19 Linux kernel. You might be wondering, you just talked about the Linux kernel 5.2, and now this is coming with 4.19. Why is it so old? And the reason is because Debian is meant to be a foundational distro. It's meant to be the most stable, most reliable, most solid that you can possibly get. And therefore, they typically use older versions and in most cases, LTS versions of any kind of software they can possibly find. And in this case, that's why 4.19 of the Linux kernel is being utilized. It's also why they have 3.30 of GNOME. Uh, KDE Plasma 5.14 instead of 5.16, and etc. Most of these packages are frozen at a specific point so they can get ready to release. And during the process of the freeze to the release, there are a lot of typically a lot of new releases for those particular things. So that's why, because they're focused on heavy heavy testing and making sure what they what they release is very solid, very stable and is more of a foundational distro. Like their goal is more foundational rather than being uh, always so fast up to date and stuff like that. And I think they'd accomplish their goal of being foundational and very important very, very well. So that's why the Linux kernel is slightly older than what we just talked about. There's also quite a few things that I find interesting about this particular release of Debian. And on top of just the fact that it's a new version of Debian, and that is uh, a couple things I want to cover. First of all, AppArmor is a kernel security module and is now able, enabled by default in Debian 10. It was already available in Debian, but it wasn't enabled by default, and now it is. Now, this has a lot of interesting things because it's a, secu- a security module that can improve the security of the system, but it also is how the SNAP systems are doing confinement. So it makes it possible and more easy to have SNAPs added to a Debian system. Another interesting thing is that they now have, finally, support for UEFI Secure Boot. And this is great because it makes it a lot easier to get Debian up and running on a system that has Secure Boot enabled, like, for example, if you're dual booting Windows or whatnot. Uh, So this is really good that they've added that. And they've also started to do something that's interesting because I didn't expect Debian to do it so quickly in comparison to, you know, I'd expect other distros to do it first uh, because Debian is more like the you know, cautious and super stable, super solid approach. They've decided to actually turn on Wayland by default for GNOME instead of Xorg. Now, this does not apply to the other DEs, but if you choose to use GNOME in the installer, it will start using Wayland by default. And I think this is pretty interesting because Debian is not typically the people who are testing things like this. Uh, you know, for example, Fedora was the first distro I know of to activate Wayland by default in a big mainstream way. It wasn't the first distro to do that, but it was the first to do it in a mainstream approach. Uh, so that's interesting that Debian is going to is going to follow that lead and do the same thing for the GNOME system or de- desktop environment. So that's pretty cool. Um, I, I wonder, I'm curious what to see what happens there because there could be some some issues there, and there it might work out great. I don't know, uh, but it is great to see that that Debian is testing things out like this and adding support for the App Armor stuff and the UEFI Secure Boot and all that stuff. It's really great to see. And I am super happy to see the latest version of Debian 10 being released. And if you'd like to learn more about this particular release of Debian 10 Buster, I have a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show is some more awesome news from the Pine64 team, and that is the Pinebook Pro pre-orders are starting soon. So they're actually going to be starting on July 25th, which is fantastic because that means the Pinebook Pro is coming soon. And I cannot wait to try out this new device. I am a fan of the Pinebook original. I actually have one with me right here. As you can say, see in the video version, it says Pinebook. And of course, it's running KDE Plasma on this Pinebook. And I think the Pinebook is a fantastic uh, little laptop, especially considering its price. But there are a couple things that I wish it had. And the Pinebook Pro does seem to be covering 
all of the things that I wish it had. So I can't wait to try the Pinebook Pro because there's so much potential in this particular, the, the original Pinebook. So the Pinebook Pro is going to be even better. I just, I just can't wait. They also announced new things for the Pinebook Pro that's even better than we already knew it was going to be. So for example, they up, they announced that they're going to have a better uh, you know, privacy features because they're adding privacy switches. They're adding three privacy switches mapped to the F1, F2, and F3 keys to be able to disable from on the hardware side the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi modules, the webcam, and the microphone. So you can basically rest assured that you have privacy because your software is not going to be able to use these pieces of hardware because they will not be active unless you make them active. Like some laptops, unfortunately, the webcam would always be active and any software that wanted access could get it. And in this case, they're putting in a hardware switch allowing you to turn off the hardware. So that is very cool. There's also announced that there's going to do a bunch of different flavors for their Pro, uh, Pinebook Pro OS. So for example, they're going to give a lot of different distro options. They're going to also make it possible to run Chromium OS if you want to do that, or even Android 9 if for some reason you want to do that. So it's kind of cool because it's kind. it also, not only is it going to be a great laptop for Linux usage in the sense of like, uh, you know, everyday type of, mu of usage, and it also is going to be kind of a competitor to Chrome or Chromebooks because it's even going to have Chromium OS as an option. So a lot of cool stuff there, and I can't wait to see what happens. Uh, they've also said they're going to have a lot of cool uh, updates to the batter battery life because not only are they going to have a bigger battery for the Pinebook Pro. They're also updating, making it more efficient so the battery life will last even longer. Now, I would like to point out that this this original Pinebook that I'm showing on the videos, if you're watch, if you're listening to the audio version, I'm sorry, but the original Pinebook has fantastic battery life because it is an ARM-based laptop and it works quite well. The next Pinebook is going to have a more beefier ARM processor and a more beefier RAM but, but they're also going to have more uh, stronger battery life. So I am super excited. Uh, but I can go ahead and tell you that this battery life on this laptop is roughly around anywhere between six to eight hours, depending on what you're doing, how much you're using it, and what brightness level you have. I typically run it at about 50% brightness because I don't use it, I don't need it most of the time. And that amount of brightness usually works quite well for the laptop for a long period of time. Look, what's funny is about when I first started using the Pinebook, I didn't think it was that good of a, of a product because the keyboard had a couple issues here and there, and I didn't think it'd be possible to use it for any length of time. However, I decided one time when I went, to, I traveled a little while back, and well, actually quite a long ways back, I went on a, on a trip, and I decided to take it with me. And then I took my other laptop too, which had, you know, the basics of what you expect a laptop to have. But it had some very bad battery life, and I didn't really like it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to give Pinebook a chance. I brought it with me. Why not? And I fell in love with this thing. It is such a good experience. I mean, if you're using it for a secondary lap as a secondary device, I don't, it wouldn't be my personal like go-to primary device because it can't run all applications because it needs to have a, an ARM it needs to be an ARM build for whatever you want to run, and not everything is built on ARM. So I don't think it would be like my go-to only app only system but as a secondary device it is fantastic and i think the pinebook pro is going to be even better now also for the uh audio viewers uh so, wait what that's not even a thing so the video viewers uh you can see here next to the alt and function key there's this weird uh icon on the key and that is the super key now a lot of people were kind of bothered by that and they recognize that as a problem and they're going to fix it. So the next version with the Pine, Pine Book Pro is going to have a Pine 64 logo on that keycap. So they're putting a lot of attention to detail and I'm just pretty excited. If you'd like to learn more, I'll have a link to the Pine Book Pro uh, July News uh, blog post in the show notes below. Up next in the show this week is the latest release of 2.10 for the Open Build Service or OBS. This is a service created by the SUSE team for the an Open SUSE project to create a really cool way of package of creating packages. So that's more an automated system. It can make RPMs, it can make DEBs, it can make tar.ex or tar.xz files for Arch and 
all kinds of stuff. It's a very, very cool system. And I wanted to cover this latest release. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff that's in this one, but it's not like a huge, massive release. It's a two, it's a point release, 2.10. But I wanted to cover it because I've never talked about the OBS on the show before. And I think the Open Build Service is one of those things that sets OpenSUSE and SUSE apart from the rest of the pack because they build these really cool infrastructure pieces and a lot of the time they don't get credit for these uh, these things these, they build and in many cases they're even game changers like for example the OBS or open build service is one of those game changers because it makes it possible to put source code on their service or their servers and then to automatically build packages for Ubuntu, Debian, Arch, Fedora, etc, etc you know of course OpenSUSE as well and a lot of cool features just by setting up a spec file and putting the source code there and just let it run. That is a really, really cool concept and I like the OBS for that purpose. Now, the latest version of 2.10 has even made it more improved by making better support for building containers for their, through the OBS. They've been working on having, they've had support for container building since 2017 but they've made it possible to make made it even better with these latest versions so that you can have integrated uh, registry and notary to keep track of who has shipped what and when the binary tracking for and with bad binary tracking for the containers so that is really cool and it supports uh, the rec- the uh, the OpenSUSE recommended uh, system for containers and it also has support for docker and that is pretty cool in addition to this, they also have revamped their web web interface where it used to feel a little dated and now it is it essentially has the same workflow and the same system, but it looks much more modern, which as a designer marketer, I applaud that decision because it did need it. So there you go. Good job on that. And in addition to all of that, they've also done a lot of bug fixes and probably one of the most important things here uh, not a most important things, but a very important thing is that they, you know, they've had support for integration with GitHub for a very long time. But since the whole Microsoft bought GitHub thing, a lot of people wanted support for GitLab. And OBS has now, with 2.10, now has support for GitLab. And also, uh, Fedora's Pagur, which is named after a hermit crab, I think. Anyway, uh, the Pagur. Uh, project from Fedora for the same kind of uh, integration features as well as the GitLab and the previous GitHub stuff. So that is very, very cool. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Open OpenBuild service, I'll have a link to the 2.10 release in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the latest release of Grub Bootloader, and that is the 2.04 release. There's a lot of stuff in this particular release, which is pretty cool, such as the native UEFI secure boot support, support for F2FS file system, support for multi or multiple early init RD images, uh, various enhancements and improvements to uh, ButterFS, including Z- ZSTD support and RAID 5 and 6 support, UEFI TPM 1.2 and 2.0 support, Update support, uh, compiler support for GCC 8 and GCC 9, uh, VLAN support, native DHCP support, and uh, many, many, many things, including architecture fixtures as well as bug fixes. In fact, there's also one that's really cool. I'd really like to, I'm glad to see that they're doing this uh, because the Risk Five architecture has now been added for support in the Grub bootloader, which is really cool because I look forward to the day that the Risk Five. Uh, architecture because it's an open source architecture for software hardware when as soon as that uh, I, I look forward to the day that becomes like the standard uh, because open source in every possible way is going to be an, an improvement to the existing uh, nonsense that we sometimes have to deal with it's really cool to see uh, grub 2.0.4 supporting all these things including risk 5 and the uefi secure boot support so Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about the particular release of Grub 2.0.4, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Next in the show is Linux Mint has an announcement on their latest blog post about the 20.x dropping 32-bit releases. Now, this is not meaning dropping 32-bit support uh, because they actually are talking about dropping the ISOs of releases. Now, Linux Mint 19.x is uh, already available with 32-bit, and that is because it's based on 18.04, which also means it's going to have support up until 2023, the five-year support that Ubuntu typically uses as well. And I think that it's it's fair to say that most people don't really care about having 32-bit ISOs, 
uh, mint it was kind of one of those things where like when you have mint xfce some people would say that they wanted that for that but overall i think you know going forward it's going to be a, a, a good thing to do in the future for them to drop it as well as most distros to drop it there should be some you know obscure here and there uh, options for people who still want to use super ancient hardware uh, but for those that don't or have you know something made within the last decade uh, they can use you know everything else so i understand why linux mint is doing it but it's also kind of interesting because they didn't really have that much of a choice now the reason 19.0 19.x or 19.1 and etc had support for 32-bit is because Ubuntu was maintaining all of those 32-bit packages, making it possible for Mint to release 32-bit versions, just like Lubuntu did for the 18.04 release. Uh, however, since they're not going to be maintaining those packages anymore, they're going to be sticking to the base libs that we talked about in the last episode. Uh, that makes it more difficult for Linux Mint to do so. So they're going to be dropping the releases, the 32-bit ISOs and 32-bit releases for the whole uh, distro, but they're going to still keep the support of the base libs because of, you know, thanks to Ubuntu and their support via Ubuntu. So essentially, they didn't really have a choice in this matter, but at the same time, it's a good thing because it really needs to happen at least to drop the ISOs because it's a lot of work and not much benefit, and not many people use it. So it doesn't really make sense to continue doing it. Uh, but at the same time, it is good that they're keeping the base libs, you know, thanks to Canonical, but still it's good to keep them base libs because base libs are important and if you want to know why they're important check out the last episode actually the last two episodes of this week in linux where i explain in pretty pretty deep detail about why the 32-bit base libs or base libraries are very important so check those out i have a link to those in the show notes if you'd like as well as the latest blog post and for the linux mint in the show notes below i'm next in the show this week is magia 7 magia is a really interesting distribution. If you've not heard of it, it has a lot of cool features, but I wanted to cover, like, before, just, you know, the history of it is that Magia is a fork of Mandriva Linux. It was created by former employees of Mandriva SA, and it has a lot of different uh, options for, like, DEs for, like, Plasma, GNOME, XFCE, and others. So it's definitely worth checking out. But if you want to know about the current version, uh, this latest release has updates for, um, you know, they've added support and improvements to Wayland. They've added better uh, support for hybrid graphics, like Optimus graphics, in, like, laptops and that kind of thing. Uh, they've also added an additional DE, as well as some new window manager options. They've uh, upgraded their games collection as well as upgraded the kernel to 5.1.14, which is right before the latest release. Now, reasonably, this Magia was released before the 5.2 uh, kernel was released, so that's why they don't have that particular release. Uh, but they have kernel 5.1.14, Mesa drivers 19.1, Plasma 5.15.4, known 3.32, and they also have a pre-alpha for the uh, XFCE 4.14. Uh, they've also added improved support for ARM. It's still experimental, but they are working on that, which is really cool. And they've completely reworked the welcome screen, uh, making it much more uh, efficient and easier to use, which is fantastic. And they've also uh, started you know, working on some improvements to using the DNF package manager that they recently switched to. Well, fairly recently switched to anyway. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of cool stuff about uh, Magia, and I think it is definitely worth checking out if you haven't used it before. Uh, some people would kind of consider it boring because it just works, and I think in many cases just working is fantastic for some people, or a lot of people really. Uh, but if you're that kind of person who doesn't want things to just work and you want to mess around with stuff, it might not be great for you, but in general, I think that Magia is definitely worth checking out. And also, I do like, I want to point out that the Magia uh, project also has something called the Cauldron repo. And the Cauldron repo is similar to the Rawhide for Fedora, where it has beta releases and experimental releases. But what's really cool about uh, Magia is that they their Cauldron repo is, well, it's, it's, it's hard to say that it's very stable because it's beta. Like, pretty much everything in there is beta or experimental. But it's surprisingly solid and surprisingly beta, but stable for a beta repo. So, uh, based on my experience. Now, I can't say that it's, you know, super stable like Debian or anything, but it is impressive how how much effort they put into making sure that it's as stable as they possibly can with beta software. It's a pretty cool distribution. And if you haven't checked it out, it, you definitely need to at least once uh, because it might be one that just, you know, pulls you in and keeps you there. Uh, it definitely has the possibility of doing that. So be sure to check out the latest release of Magia 7. I'll have a link to the show notes. And uh, what? I have a link to the release notes in the show notes below. 
This episode of This Week in Linux is also made possible by the fantastic people over on Patreon and Sponsors. If you're not sure, if you're not aware, that you can become a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash Patreon and tuxdigital.com slash Sponsors. And patrons are basically contributing a monthly on a monthly basis some sort of mo- monetary contribution, whether that's one dollar, three dollars, or more. And they're doing that over on tuxdigital.com slash sponsors or tuxdigital.com slash Patreon. And by doing so, not only are you helping me be able to make this content and create and to help build stuff for the channel, it also makes it possible for you to get your uh, certain perks and rewards for being a, being a patron. Like, for example, early access to uh, content that I've created, also getting access to unedited versions of the this week in Linux podcast and a variety of other things. If you'd like to become a sponsor or become a patron, be sure to go to tuxdigital.com slash Patreon or tuxdigital.com slash sponsors to find out more. And I really just want to reiterate, it is fantastic and awesome that everybody who is contributing to the pot to the podcast in this way, uh, it means a ton to me and it makes it so much more possible for me to make this show and devote the time needed to do so. So anyway, thanks again. And if you'd like to become a patron, I have a link to everything in the show notes. So let's get on with the show. Up next in the show is Hunix 15. Uh, Hunix is an operating system focused on security and privacy, uh, and it's using the Tor network and a heavily configured Debian uh, base for their distribution. In fact, this latest release uh, ports and or updates to the Debian 10 Buster release that just came out as well. So that's pretty awesome uh, because it's keeping up to date with the latest versions as well as being a security you know structure. And because it doesn't use the Tor network in the browser sense, it uses the Tor network uh, for like a desktop wide security. You know, so it's like extra, even more uh, private and secure in that sense. Uh, it's kind of similar to Tails, uh, but it's not in the sense of like uh, amnesic and the part where Tails, every time you boot it, it like deletes its history. Whereas Hunix is kind of more of a uh, use it for like more permanent usage, but still focused heavily on security and privacy. Uh, anyway, they've done a lot of other things in the version for 15. They've uh, hardened the kernel more. They've set up some blacklisting of uncommon network protocols. Uh, they've had done some sandboxing for system D uh, units. Uh, they've uh, updated the software and uh, various packages as well as bug fixes and all kinds of stuff. So if you are interested in checking out a distribution and are very heavily focused on privacy and security, then Hunix 15 is definitely a good choice to check out. I have a link to the latest release in the show notes for Hunix 15. So now in the show, I just want to take a moment to celebrate the anniversary of both Zorin OS and Gaming on Linux, which is they have now reached their 10-year anniversary, which is awesome. So Zorin OS is an interesting distribution for uh, new users if you'd like to check it out. I think we, we've covered it in the previous uh, episodes. I don't remember exactly which episode was the most recent, but it was only a couple episodes back. I have a link to that one in the show notes if you'd like more details about Zorin OS in the latest free, uh, release of 15. Uh, but I also want to take a t- little bit of time to talk about uh, Gaming on Linux because Gaming on Linux was a, a website that was created a long time ago, 2009, obviously. And I think that it's it's, it's worth mentioning because uh, Gaming on Linux was created when Gaming on Linux was basically you know, like 10 games. So in 10 years, it go from 10 games to thousands upon thousands of games with Valve coming in and op- opening up the uh, you know the Steam Play and doing the Steam machines and uh, setting doing the the Steam Play with uh, Proton, as well as having native Linux games and and pushing so much for the Linux as a platform for gaming. And n- since the inception of gaming on Linux dot com, which was ten years you know ten years ago, there was very few games to the now massive amount of games. Which is you know it was kind of funny because when I, f- I talked to Liam about that in particular when. We had him on Destination Linux in an interview. We talked about the fact that when Gaming on Linux was first created, he maybe made like one or two articles every few months or so, maybe even once a year, depending on what it was. And then all of a sudden it is just explodes and now he's making multiple articles every day. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of work to go to start from there and to, you know, eventually graduate to 
the massive amount of stuff that they're doing now. So that's awesome. And I just want to give them, you know, a shout out on the show because they're doing a lot of great work and uh, we appreciate it for the show because you, they also help us get new uh, topics for gaming related topics for the show. So thanks again to gaming on Linux and also, uh, you know, happy anniversary to both gaming on Linux.com and Zorin OS. Speaking of using gaming on Linux.com for articles about gaming, Valve is asking for testers for their new Mesa shader compiler. And this is really, really awesome based on the uh, results and performance that it improves. So well, I'll get to the details in a second, but I wanted to let you know that we talked about this on the latest uh, episode of Destination Linux. If you're not aware, Destination Linux is a podcast that I'm also a part of where we have discussions. Uh, it's basically, it's, sometimes it's around news, sometimes it's just in general uh, Linux-related content and open source discussions about Linux and that kind of thing. Uh, it's a really great podcast. You should definitely check it out at, at destinationlinux.org. Uh, but I just wanted to point out the reason why I'm bringing it up is because in the next episode of Destination Linux, we talk about this particular topic in much more in depth. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. Uh, one of the things we talked about in that episode is that the, it's interesting that these distros are not really working that hard to you know, help out AMD as much as they are with NVIDIA. And it's just kind of odd that it's not like no, they're not they're not putting as much effort to help AMD, which is the open source, the only open source GPU company you know, period. I mean, well, technically the, the hardware itself is not open, but the software is open source. So they, they're the only company that provides open source GPU drivers. And it's really weird that we're not pushing them more and trying to, you know, you know, reward them for doing, uh, being stewards of the community and doing open source software. But Valve has decided that they will pick up the slack. So Back in 2016, Steam started sponsoring open source driver engineers and found and the foundation for uh, Valve's open source graphics group. Uh, during this time, they received a ton of community help, and they want to help. They want your help again. So currently, AMD OpenGPL, op- <laughs> AMD OpenGL, and Vulkan drivers use a shader compiler that is part of the upstream LLVM, and this has worked, you know, fairly well. But it also has some issues. Uh, you know, inadvertent issues that it creates, as well as, you know, kind of an, uh, an issue with compile times. Uh, but the, the, t- the AMD are working on this new project they're calling ACO, and it is focused on improving the compile time because it's very critical for gaming. So Valve's efforts have been improving the usage of uh, compile times on this using this project by improving it, cutting it nearly in half for the compile times, as well as giving a big boost for frames per second. Uh, They also think they've only just scratched the surface of what this new compiler can do. So there's a ton of potential, and we're going to talk about it much more on the next episode of Destination Linux, so be sure to uh, go to destinationlinux.org to check that out. Uh, It's episode 129. Uh, It's not out technically yet as the recording and, and release of this episode, but it will be out in a couple days or so. Uh, it's definitely worth uh, you know viewing that because the, the, we go in depth, especially Ryan, because Ryan is a hardware guy and a big AMD fan, so he knows a lot more about this particular topic. We actually had Ryan on the uh, the episode of this week in Linux prior uh, previously to talk about the latest hardware that AMD's uh, releasing. So uh, he's, he knows his stuff about that stuff, that kind of thing. So be sure to check that out for Destination Linux 129. Uh, but I do think this is really awesome. And it is definitely worth checking out if you're willing to uh, test it and you have some, you know, high-end AMD cards, uh, be sure to, you know, participate in this particular thing because uh, based on the testing that Ryan has shown to me, uh, this is a game changer. And I know that is a weird pun, but it is also true. So it both changes the way the games play as well as changes the structure of, you know, whatever. (laughs) Anyway, if you'd like to learn more, uh, be sure to check out the show notes for This Week in Linux, as well as the episode 129 for Destination Linux. Up next in the show is a new impressive tiling shell extension for the GNOME shell, and that is called Material Shell. Now, it's not just a tiling window manager for GNOME. It also has a a material design uh, application to it, in the sense of way it lays out the different workspaces, the way it lays out applications when you load them, and it also adds the uh, tiling functionality to it, which is really cool. I think this is actually 
one of those things where I don't really like the work. The, well, I do. I kind of like the workflow, but I don't like the layout of GNOME. And I think that this Material Shell uh, replacement extension has a lot of potential to make me interested in trying out, you know, GNOME again. I'd prefer it to be on, you know, Plasma, of course. So they should, if you want to make a Material Shell for Plasma, that'd be awesome. Might be easier to do anyway as well. But anyway, this replaces the standard shell with a workflow that is unique and keyboard driven and has a focus on tiling window management. Uh, and the uh, developer of Material shell, shell said, Material Tiling Shell Replacement for GNOME Shell that aims to simplify and accelerate daily workflow and productivity. Now, I think this looks pretty awesome and I do prefer, I, I do wish it had a Plasma version, but. Uh, if you are using GNOME and you like this kind of layout, I think it looks pretty slick. And uh, yeah, I actually might try it anyway, even though I'm not a GNOME user. I might uh, try out this because it just looks so slick. So anyway, if you'd like to learn more about this, I'll have a link to the material shell in the show notes below. Up next in the show is some hardware news. Uh, so actually a couple of pieces of hardware news. But first up is the Odaki, the Odake, I'm not sure, uh, Blade X 4K 15.6 inch portable monitor. Now it's not necessarily really like focus on the 4K. It has support for 4K, uh, but it also it's mainly like defaults to 1080p. Uh, but it's a 15.6 inch display, like I said, that has support for uh, native HDMI input. It also is a 1.89 pound display with a built-in battery and speakers as a part of the stand. That's why it's kind of heavy because it has a it has a stand in the back that makes it uh, has the pads battery and speakers built into it and it also is where you plug in everything so they're in the front there's a really thin monitor but then there's like a like a base station sort of thing that has all the connection stuff so you can make it work in portrait or landscape modes depending on what kind of connections you want to use uh, it supports USB-C and HDMI inputs however there are some issues with USB-C for the display at the moment but there are working to improve those in the future uh, so if you do want to get it the HDMI you would need to use an HDMI uh, you know cord to use that uh, but most of the time you'd want to use HDMI anyway uh, if you know you, there might be some things you want to use as USB Type C for other things more than just display. So uh, anyway, it's pretty cool. I think this is an, a really interesting thing because I've never seen a portable monitor like this that has you know easy support for Linux. And their price is kind of high. It's like two hundred and eighty dollars or something like that. So it is it's kind of high, but. Uh, they're currently on uh, the Indiegogo uh, campaign right now, and they've already reached their goal like massively. I think it's like a hundred, yeah, one hundred and fifty-three thousand dollars has been pledged for their twenty thousand dollar goal. So they've had a seven hundred and sixty-nine percent backing for it. So a lot of people seem to be very interested in this. And if you are one of those people too, uh, you know it's, it might be worth checking out. They still have twenty-two days left as of this recording. If you'd like to be a part of the Indiegogo campaign. Uh, there is actually a another thing I want to talk about. This is that there was a review by Pharonix, uh, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes if you'd like to check out more about his experience, uh, Michael Larabelle's experience with using this particular monitor. So I have a link to both the Indiegogo campaign and that Pharonix article in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the new NVIDIA offerings for the GeForce RTX Super Series or Super Series and uh, whatever. Uh, that's just a weird uh, differentiator between their RTX series and now their new one is the RTX Super series. Like they didn't put much effort into the branding for that, or but whatever. Uh, so there, th this was interesting because we talked about uh, this before and the fact that I Nvidia has been ramping up their efforts in the Linux space and as far as like competing with AMD because you know Nvidia previously were just kind of competing with themselves and then they didn't put much effort into their you know, innovations or really whatever. They just like the next year is like, yeah, it's slightly better, whatever. Uh, but since AMD has been like pushing them farther and farther, they have been, uh, you know, aggressive trying to uh, respond to AMD. And the super offerings are now another line that they're trying to do. So this new uh, RTX 2060 super GPU, uh, they're, they're starting with that for tw uh, $299 with 50% faster speeds than the original 2060. They have revised the RTX 2070 for 499, and that has 16% faster than the 2070. And they've also upgraded the 20, 2080 to with 699 in price for the Super. Uh, and it's pretty interesting because the 2060 and the 2070 will be available pretty soon, but the 
uh, 2080 Super will not be available until the 23rd of July. So anyway, it's kind of interesting because NVIDIA is kind of reacting to the market shifts and having to, com to compete with AMD. And we've talked about this particular issue on the Destination Linux podcast as well. And you should definitely check out the next episode uh, or a couple episodes ago. We talked about AMD and NVIDIA and how really as Linux users, we not only are benefiting from AMD competing by making good hardware and being open source. They're also pushing NVIDIA so much that really the NVIDIA users also need to thank AMD for the amount of work that they're forcing AMD or NVIDIA to do because prior you would be lucky if you got an update, you know, once every year or so, you know, if that, because back in the day, NVIDIA didn't even care at all. And then AMD announced we're going open source, uh, full Linux support, all that stuff. And then NVIDIA is like, uh oh, so we have to catch up. And then now the NVIDIA support is so much better than it used to be. And you can thank AMD for that too. So I really like to see competition like this because it, you know, just benefits the consumer. And in not only in that, it actually makes them compete on the better hardware as well as the price because the next topic about AMD is a new piece of hardware that they even lowered the price on before they, before they even shipped it because they're wanting to compete even more with NVIDIA. So let's get to that one. Up next in the show, AMD has announced the Radeon Pro WX3200, and they've actually dropped the price to $199 USD before it's even out. And they're going to be competing with NVIDIA, of course. So like the, as I was saying, the competition has improved on all sides. So that's awesome. Uh, this is a wor workstation budget graphics card. It's not really meant for, you know, super high end gaming, uh, but it also is a pretty powerful card for a reasonable price. So the single slot graphics card is for 199 USD based on AMD's Polaris architecture, not the newer Vega or Navi architecture, a uh, slightly older version. Uh, but it also means that the support in Linux will be very, very good. So that is definitely a great uh, bonus to this card if you wanted to get something like this. Uh, the WX3200 has 10 compute units, has compute performance of to uh, 1.6, 1.66 teraflops, and support for 4K and 8K displays, as well as has 4 gigs of GDDR5 memory, uh, video memory. So that is pretty cool. That's a fairly beefy card for only $199. So if you're into the, interested in that, or you're not really interested in having like really high-end gaming, you might want to check this out. Uh, so the AMD Radeon Pro WX3200, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show this week, and actually finally this week, is the latest updates for Rocket League. I'm actually a really big fan of this sh of this game. If you've never seen the show before, and well, seen enough episodes of the show. Uh, you might not have seen that I've, you know, I've talked about Rocket League on many, many occasions, and I am a big fan. I've been playing for quite a long time, about three years or so, uh, and Rocket League has turned is turning four this month, and they are introducing a new game mode called Spike Rush. This is during the Radical Summer event, and they have multiple different game modes that they're making. The first game mode was mediocre; it was okay, I guess, but it wasn't really that fun. The Spike Rush game mode is awesome. So there's this uh, mode in Rocket League called Rumble. And inside of Rumble, uh, imagine Rocket League, well, if you never heard of Rocket League specifically, uh, Rocket League is a essentially playing soccer with cars that also have rocket boosters on the back of them so you can fly around and stuff. It's definitely a weird type of game, and I totally admit that, but it's also very, very fun to play. So if you've never played it, Definitely check it out, especially considering it's on sale right now as of this particular recording, and it will be on sale for a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, I will have this episode out pretty soon tonight, so hopefully you'll be able to, you know, get this, get it on sale because you can get the Game of the Year edition for only twelve dollars and fifty cents thanks to the Steam Summer Sale. If you watch this after the fact, unfortunately, I apologize for you know not getting it out sooner, but. I did talk about the Steam Summer Sale last week, which I also talked about Rocket League, so I guess kind of there's that. But anyway, this is really cool because Rocket League turns four, and they added the Spike Rush game mode. So as I was saying, the combination of Rocket League plus also uh, Mario Kart with all the power-ups and stuff is kind of what Rumble is. And one of the power-ups in Rumble is spikes. As you can see in the video version, spikes come out of the car, 
uh, and you can actually like dig into the ball and then carry the ball like it's stuck to you. So it's a really cool uh, game mode because now everyone has spikes at all times. Now, people like to say that the spikes are kind of OP or overpowered in the rumble mode because as soon as you get them, you can just fly across the, the court into the goal uh, and you, people have to kind of like catch you. So it's, it's kind of difficult. The spike rush game mode changes it a lot and makes it way more fun because everyone has spikes at all times. As soon as you touch the ball with the spikes, you lose all your boost and you lose the ability to pick up boost so you can't go super fast and you can't fly. So you have to find out new techniques and two new ways to get around everyone who also actually has spikes and they get to use their boost until they get the ball. And not only that, they also made it where if you hit someone who has the ball and you just hit the car, you also make them explode. Whether whatever speed you're going, it doesn't matter. So there's a it's a really chaotic and it's super fun, and I really like this mode. So the previous mode, meh. This mode is awesome, and I hope they keep it because it is really really fun. Uh, if you ever checked out Rocket League, be sure to check out the uh, Steam Summer Sale to get uh, lo the Rocket League. Uh, for the game of the year edition for 1250, I think is what it is, and you can get it right now on the summer sale. And you can go to tuxedo.com slash steam sale, well, you, and, and then search for Rocket League, and that it will show you a list of all the Linux games that are currently on sale through the Steam sale or the summer sale. So check that out at tuxedo.com slash steam sale. And also, by the way, there's no affiliate link there, it's just a quick access to get to the search results because I found it really awkward trying to get to it previously. Now you can get to it much easier by going to that link, tuxedo.com slash steam sale, and it will pre-filter all games that are Linux compatible and on sale. So check that out, tuxedo.com slash steam sale. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many others. You can learn more by going to TuxDigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to TuxDigital.com slash Linux Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to TuxDigital.com slash Linux Everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. We also have ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, and many more by going to TuxDigital.com slash affiliates. And if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux as I'm a co-host of that show. And just a reminder, the show is live usually every Saturday. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. This week it wasn't live, but that's because I was actually out of town add a thing well you'll see uh, check out the next episode of destination linux and you'll see exactly where i was so anyway thanks again for watching i'm michael tonell with tux digital and as always keep using learning and enjoying linux